Cora TV. The world is thinking. Good evening. I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the owners here of Politics and Prose. First, I assured Christopher Hitchens that I had checked everybody's ID at the door. They're highbrows, they have a high tolerance of outrage, and they also have a very good sense of humor. So we, ha we have it. And, cre and, cre and, cre and credit cards too. So we have, we have a good audience here tonight. We need to have a good audience because that, uh, our author tonight was named by Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, they're the head of their list of the 100 uh, top public intellectuals in the world. Uh, the London Observer has named him as one of the most brilliant journalists of our time. It's a lot to live up to this evening, Christopher. <laughs> Uh, Christopher Hitchens has uh, been a longtime contributor to Vanity Fair, The Nation, Slate, Times Literary Supplement, The Spectator, The Atlantic Monthly, and it could go on and on like that. But you know, I really shouldn't even have to introduce him. I thought I could just pass out copies of Michael Kingsley's Over the Top front page review in the New York Times coming up this Sunday. Right there in God distrust. It's a one. <laughs> it's it's a wonderful review. It's what uh, I sh I, sh I can't put really put it this way. It's what all every author prays for. <laughs> Michael Kingsley writes in the review, Hitchens is, a, is uh, the bohemian and the swell, the dashing foreign, foreign correspondent, the painstaking literary critic, and the intellectual engagé. Uh, I will say this, that Michael Kingsley takes uh, Christopher Hitchens to task for being a little bit too, too quick to resort to French in search of le mot juste, but uh, <laughs> Michael Kingsley, you might point out to him, Christopher, is guilty of a little bit of the same thing in this review. Uh, Michael Kingsley goes on to say that Christopher Hitchens charms Washington hostesses, but will set off a stink pot if the opportunity presents itself. Now, I'm a little bit ambivalent uh, about whether I want to offer that opportunity this, this evening. Uh, Christopher Hitchens' self-described hope in this book is that this book will become part of the long overdue fight back against superstition, sexual repression, political fanaticism, and all the other ways in which the faith-based uh, have chosen to present themselves. And as Kingsley ends his review, he says, God should be flattered. Unlike, un, unlike most of those clamoring for his attention, Hitchens treats him like an adult. <laughs> uh, one, one, one final word on his recent 58th birthday in April. Christopher Hitchens became an American citizen. So we all want to wish you happy birthday and welcome to America. <laughs> uh, an impossibly handsome and generous introduction for which many thanks. Um, my fellow Americans. <laughs> uh, I've waited, <laughs> waited a long time to say that. It was the 13th of April last, and indeed, Mr. Jefferson's birthday and mine. And I took my oath at his memorial on the Tidal Basin, and I swore particularly to renounce one foreign prince among all the ones I was sworn to abjure, the slobbering Dauphin Prince Charles, <laughs> uh, who, because of... Uh, because of when his mother's demise should occur, God should forbid it, but when it does occur, will become not just the head of the state, in the, my country of birth, but the head of the armed forces and the head of the church, and can't stay married. 
um, and can't seem to tell a nice girl from a nasty one, and, uh, and says that he wants to become a Muslim. This is what you get when you found a church on the family values of Henry VIII. <laughs> I sometimes think that you, you, my fellow Americans who came by this naturally, didn't have the strain of going through Homeland Security before putting up your hand, don't know how lucky you are, but it's at least given me a new slogan. Which, to which I invite your uh, attention. Um, when I took my oath to the man who wrote and wanted it among the few things mentioned on his obelisk, uh, the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, which becomes the basis of our very precious First Amendment, um, it occurred to me to say, uh, in honor of his most famous defense of that position, Mr. Jefferson, build up this wall. Well, I'm, I'm not going to, of course, it's slightly depressing to see how many lugubrious atheists are here with nothing better to do <laughs> on an evening so full of the bounties of God and the uh, benisons that he showered on you. But, so I won't detain you long. I, I just, I think one can make the case that my book makes under a couple of brief headings, uh, which I will do, and uh, then I'll be your prisoner and I'll be the hostage of any questioner. Um, Religion itself begins in the infancy, the fearful, cringing, excremental infancy. Infancy is charming in infants, not very charming in grown-ups, uh, of our species, of our species. Religion begins at a time when people don't know there's a germ theory of disease. They don't know that the uh, earth revolves around the sun. In fact, they believe the contrary. They don't know whether the earth is round or flat. They don't know when they're told they're given dominion over all species in Genesis. Just, not just that the passage doesn't mention any marsupials, because the writers don't know of the existence of Australia. It doesn't mention any microorganisms over which, alas, we still don't have dominion. It's, uh, it's, uh, it comes from this primitive, base, cringing, fearful period. But w our minds, fortunately, are still patterned to look for argument and for explanation, and even a conspiracy theory is better than no theory at all, and religion is essentially the conspiracy theory of the origin of the cosmos and of species, but as Heinrich Heine so beautifully put it, in the period before his books were burned and his uh, reputation besmirched, uh, in times of extreme darkness where you don't know the road, even a local who is blind and death may be a good guide. But when this dawn breaks, uh, you can bid adieu to this, uh, to this guide, however decent he was to you when it was dark. So that the religious have everything still ahead of them. They've never been able to prove the existence of God. Their cleverest theologians have broken their chops on the question. Um, and that's fine. We wouldn't expect them to. But they want to go a step further. They want to say not just that there is such an entity, but that they know his mind. And they know who, and they're able to interpret for you and tell you what to do on this basis. He knows, and they can tell you, what you may eat, with whom you may have, this is a family value store, I know, Congress. Um, <laughs> what books it might be advisable to read, uh, what other practices might be avoided. Otherwise. This, is, this is an impossible solipsism, an impossible arrogance and self-centeredness, and it comes this authoritarianism in an awfully masochistic guise, which should put you off it to begin with. It says, bear in mind that you are only dust, as the Christian book says, or you are only fashioned from a clot of blood, as the Quran says. Bear in mind that you were, you were convicted and found guilty before you were conceived of crimes in which you couldn't have possibly been involved, and you have all the burden of proof in your own defense, and you've been found guilty. But to make up for that rather horrible indictment, you can be reassured that the entire cosmos is designed with you in mind. <laughs> False consolation, and that he has a plan for you, on condition that you agree to be a serf <clears throat> forever. I'm one of the very few people, uh, I know I'm the only writer, who's been to all three axis of evil countries in in the years elapsing since 2001, I've been to Iran and to Iraq and North Korea, and I could a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul and freeze thy young blood. 
cause thy several hairs to stand on end like quills upon the fretful porpentine. But the article that I wrote that was most praised was from North Korea. I have a lot of praise for it. It's reprinted a lot. And it, I mention it because it's the article of which I'm most ashamed. Whenever, whenever I'm praised, I, I, I cringe, I clutch, because I know it's my greatest failure as a writer. I did my best to show what it might be like to be a North Korean. I, I, I tried everything I knew to try and get people to think what it would be like for 10 minutes to be a North Korean, the misery, the pointlessness, the horror, the crushing nothingness of being a, and, the, and the deprivations uh, and the humiliations that would be involved. I know I couldn't do it. I know I failed. But it taught me one thing. It answered a question I'd had since I was very small. I used to wonder what paradise would be like, as described by my preachers and tutors. They said, well, it'll be eternal praise. You get all the time to praise. You sing praises the entire time um, to someone who, in creating you, uh, was doing only what came naturally. I used to think, that sounds like hell to me. <laughs> uh, but, but I used to think also, I, but fortunately, a bit like hell, I couldn't quite imagine it. Now I can. Now I've been to a state where that's the case. Now I've been to where eternal praise is mandatory. Now I've seen a state it has a dear leader and a great leader, as probably you know. The great leader, the dear leader, as perhaps you don't know, is not in fact the president of North Korea. He's only the head of the party and of the armed forces. His late father is still the president. Thus we have a necrocracy. <laughs> or you might say a morsolocracy or a thanatocracy. And you may notice also only one short of a trinity. And that's what you have to praise from dawn till dusk. So now I know what it would be like. But there's this one exception. You can get out of North Korea. You can die. And it's over. You can't do that with monotheism. They've only just started with you. <laughs> well, you laugh. I'm trying to make you cry, and you laugh. Imagine how I feel. In the Old Testament, you find, as I say in my book in one, one or two chapters, you find the warrant for racism, <clears throat> genocide, uh, slavery, uh, w witch burning, uh, mutilation of infants, and all the rest of it. That's all mandated. But not just praised, but mandated. <clears throat> it's pr pretty rough, notoriously rough. But um, when the earth closes over you after these treatments, that's it. There's no talk of punishing the dead. Not until gentle Jesus, meek and mild, late of Nazareth, or arguably Bethlehem, is the idea of eternal torture for children who die unbaptized or in other ways unredeemed, introduced into our culture. Thus I make my central, what I think is my central point. Religion is not just untrue and an obvious man-made falsification. I think there's no one who doesn't essentially know that. But there are many people, many atheists, who say they, they can't believe it, but they wish they could. It would be nice to believe it. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> it would be the wish for uh, an absolutely impermeable dictatorship that couldn't even be criticized, let alone overthrown, that went on forever, that supervised and invigilated your every waking moment and would not stop torturing you even after you were dead. To wish this to be true is to wish to be a slave. It is an immoral belief. Um, I know that Daniel Dennett said something like this to you or some of you once before um, because I heard him do it. He's a great friend of mine. Professor Stephen Weinberg, one of our greatest uh, biologists, uh, made the, I think, very cool and laconic observation. In an average, ordinary, moral, universal moral society, people of goodwill will do such good as they can, and those who are sociopathic or psychopathic will do as much evil as it seems to them possible to do. But if you want to get good people to do wicked things, you need religion. <laughs> Who of average moral sensibility would mutilate the genitals of a child, for example? Would say, here, I've had a baby. A gift from God, perhaps, who is, by the way, a perfect designer. And what could be a better instance, if you felt that, than looking at a newborn? Maybe, maybe there is a perfect design at that. But um, on the other hand, if we sawed away at the genitalia with a sharp stone, <laughs> might look a bit better. And anyway, that's what it tells you to do. It's enough to make a cat laugh, isn't it? it would, would, or it would be if it wasn't so appalling, so obscene, so tragic, and so nasty.
to blow yourself up in an old people's home in Netanya on Passover is, is, it, is to commit an action that will be praised from minarets and along the electronic media by evil old mullahs every day. No such action could be possibly endorsed by a person of average morality uh, if it were not endorsed uh, supernaturally. I'm sure everyone here can think of their own favorite example. And so I probably would be trespassing on your time if I went on any further. But I get the impression that kind of view as it is to come, to celebrate my birthday and all, <laughs> that probably it wouldn't have been quite like this a couple of years ago. I think there's a change in the zeitgeist going on, and I have every reason to, to think that what I say is correct. Uh, Professors Dawkins and Dennett, who have both mentioned, both, and Sam Harris, who I could add, my, my other musketeer, have all found in the recent past that there's a large audience now for a bit of a resistance to clerical bullying and religious lecturing and self-righteousness and nastiness and, and menace. That we've had about enough of all this. Open a page of any newspaper and just see what you get. His Holiness the Pope, having just repudiated limbo <laughs> after a long struggle, <laughs> the place where the souls of unbaptized children always went apparently was never there. Tell it, no, no, but it's serious. Tell it to the parents of those children. I've met them. P ch people, the people who thought that's where their poor kids had gone, having died before they could breathe properly, and not, uh, that's where they thought they were. It's a re it was real to them. What casuistry is this to say, oh, it wasn't really real after we made that bit up? They can't do this. It was real. It was a real place for those parents. And for the brothers and sisters of those children, too. They wept at the thought of where the little one had gone. And to say, oh, never mind. Oh, by the way, uh, we, we were wrong about this, but we're now ready to be infallible all over again. <laughs> this is disgusting. And in the same week as he does this, the Pope repeats that we need to teach the children more about hell. Go back again to terrify the composure of the young and the innocent with these horrifying stories told them by, by maladjusted elderly virgins. This is wicked. <laughs> This is wickedness, and, you, and we know the consequences of that, which uh, have been des well, are described in my book in, as follows, because I render it in Latin, um, no child's behind left. <laughs> Crimes are committed that none of us would think of committing, but are allowed to those of faith. And uh, AIDS in Africa, says the, his holiness, may be bad, but nothing like as bad as a condom. This is not morality. And meanwhile, our Supreme Court refuses to say, as it should, that not one American dollar can be used ever for the establishment of the Jewish religion on the West Bank of the Jordan River. We will not have people who want to bring on Armageddon and the Messiah. We will not treat them as friends or as allies. We should recognize them as enemies, those who look forward eagerly to the destruction of our species and our world. That a Danish cartoonist can't do his job in Copenhagen without being uh, threatened with death and his nation's tiny economy and democracy threatened with violence and coercion is bad enough that not one American news outlet would reprint those cartoons out of sheer fear. Sheer fear and cowardice is worse. And that Borders Books should pull from the magazine rack, the only magazine that I write for, it's called The Free Inquiry, I recommend it to you, would say, oh, well, we know what to do about that. We're not selling it, is even worse. How much more of this are we going to put up with? That people will come and say, we insist on teaching pseudoscience to your children in American schools with taxpayers' money. What is this? Children, the astronomy class is over. Can you now get ready for the astrology period? <laughs> they want equal time? They don't want equal time. They want a dictatorship of pseudoscience and garbage. Um, the chemistry class is over, but after the break, uh, we'll be doing alchemy. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, on, on a condition that I propose, since George Bush in his wisdom, the man who said that Vladimir Putin is a good man because he wears a <laughs> crucifix round his neck in a strong field, the stupidest thing the president has yet said, <laughs> a man of faith says that the faith-based initiative may give government money to churches, the government looks after the, uh, the state looks after the rich, the churches can look after the poor, 
and tax breaks are given to religious institutions, very well equal time, all right, equal time. Any, all of those churches in receipt of, of subsidy or, or tax break must now teach uh, evolution half the time in their Sunday schools and their religious services and distribute the literature in their church porches. Is that what they want? I doubt it, but don't fail to take them up on it because that's what I'm talking about. We have to fight back now. We, can, we, we have the constellations of humor and irony, <clears throat> and we have a better tradition than they do. It goes back to Democritus and Epicurus and Lucretius, and it goes through uh, uh, Galileo and Newton and Spinoza and Voltaire and Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine and Albert Einstein. We have a tradition that by all means understands about the transcendent, about the awe-inspiring. We have the Hubble telescope. We have the pages of Stephen Hawking. We have the extraordinary ethical scientism of, of Albert Einstein. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We have a, something really nutritious, the beauties of science and reason and the consolations of philosophy to offer people. And we're expected to be impressed by those who talk about the burning bush. <laughs> so time for uh, resistance. Uh, to the extent that I can help to ignite it, I'm, I'm very proud for myself. To the extent that you might want to join in, I hope you will all consider yourselves incredibly welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, I wonder if I could trouble you for a couple of things. Uh, like By all you, means. Like you, I'm a refugee from the Church of England, which <laughs> Alistair mm. McIntyre described on the uh, front of Encounter in about 1960 when Honest to God came out as, it is the Englishman's religion where there is no God and it's useful to pray to him from time to time. <laughs> These right. are the chains we have to shake. Um, first of all, as to the power of prayer, I'd like you to comment on the thought that it is actually demonstrated by Pat Robertson, who prays for more space on the Supreme Court, whereupon Rehnquist drops dead. <laughs> this merely proves that Pat Robertson is a bad shot. <laughs> and secondly, and more seriously, what comfort can you give us after all these terrific uh, oratory, and I appreciate it, that you will not do a Malcolm Muggeridge on us and wind up an ass on the back of a donkey on BBC Two traipsing around the Holy Land mouthing sanctimonious pomposities. Bravo. Well, my only dissent from you is I don't think Episcopalianism and Anglicanism is as, is as innocuous as all that. Yeah, I can quote you something from memory. Who said the following and when? A nuclear war would have no more effect than moving millions of people into paradise a little sooner than they would otherwise get there. Who said that? And when? Who would you guess? You would guess it was some inquisitorial Rafsanjani figure, wouldn't you? Talking about, you know, talking about, you know, that is good, that is good. He is, he is very good. Man's good. Um, no one else would guess, I think, that that was the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1964. But he has to believe it, doesn't he? Because if he doesn't want this veil of tears to come to an end, he's not really a Christian. All we're doing here is wasting our time with our culture and our irony, our literature and so on. That's all trash. What we really want is to be dead. <laughs> <coughs> and I might add, lots of other people too. On the second point, I can be won over. I can be won over the same point. George Herbert, our greatest, uh, I think you might agree with this too, our greatest national religious poet, along with John Donne. I couldn't be without these authors. I, it's not that I have no sense of the numinous or the transcendent. Of course I do. De devotional music works some of it for me. Uh, Philip Larkin's poem on church going is one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. George Herbert refers to the sweet mediocrity of our native church. I think he understates things a little bit. <laughs> My line, on it, my line on it, and actually I, I owe the last speaker, the last question, a, a partial answer to. He asked, do I think they're all the same, all religions are the same? And I, as I said last night on, on the box, and I, w the answer is this, yes. Though a Quaker is obviously very different from a um, member of the Taliban, um, and uh, it's nonetheless the case that all, all religions, all faiths are equal glimpses of the same untruth. And they all involve the same surrender of reason and the, the reasoning faculty. And they involve the same contempt for evidence. And they involve the idea that one must respect someone for saying, I'll believe anything I'm told. I can't go 
that way. I'm, I'm, I'm the man to whom Pascal is writing when in his pensées. He says he's addressing those who are so made they cannot believe. Well, there are more of us than you might think. And even Anglicanism can produce a hateful archbishop who has to say this about nuclear war in England in the 1960s. My analogy for it would be, <coughs> and I wish I'd put it in the book, uh, La Peste, Albert Camus, The Plague. Finally, he says, that, as you re you'll remember it, the plague is over. The rats have died or disappeared. The city of Iran has returned to health. The Mediterranean is shimmering again. The white buildings have been cleaned. The people are back on the streets. But he says, and yet, the rats were only down in the sewers and waiting for the day when they could once again send themselves up to die on the streets of a free city. As long as the faith-based are around, you do not know that they will not turn their rationality to account. And it can come to you from the Pope, it can come to you from the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it can come to you from what had been for a long time a very pacific and passive religion, Shia Islam, can suddenly proclaim an Ayatollah and the end of the world and the coming of the, the, the 12th Imam. You don't know. Uh, while that remains the case, I think it's right to be as skeptical of any belief as it is of any other one. On the Muggerish point, <coughs> I debated the old fool a few times on the box, and then he stopped because he did a, he did a program called In the Steps of St. Paul, of himself waddling around the Middle East <laughs> with um, a man called Alec Vidler, who was then the Dean of Kings in Cambridge, and quite a nice old, furry old, white-haired old dean toddling along in the steps of St. Paul, and I, I wrote a review in which I titled it Vidler on the Hoof. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it for Malcolm, Malcolm and me. Mr. Hitchens, I've appreciated very much your fierce and courageous support of the U.S. effort in Iraq. I, I, I raise that issue only to, uh, to note that, that uh, in my estimation, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, the same ideology, really secular ideology, that animated Saddam Hussein was also the, 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 the animus, the, the, the sort of spirit behind the, the, the quenching of 100 million souls in the 20th century. When Solzhenitsyn said in, in uh, receiving the, the Templeton Prize in 1983 that uh, when asked why has all of this happened, his response was men have forgotten God. And I wonder in your characterization of religion as only a dictatorship, a kind of uh, mm -hmm. absolute, uh, imper Im uh, sort of uh, a permanent dictatorship, is there anything good about religion? That is, is would you admit that there, there is a, an admixture of both good and evil or is the spirit of religion only one of evil? And I wonder if you might address this within the context of the of 20th century totalitarianism yeah. especially. Uh, absolutely. And uh, thank you. Well, this, the spirit of simple credulity, for example, the, the humble faith, the person who, who puts his faith in God and tries to arrange his life and that of his family according to precept is not evil at all. But, but simple credulity can be evil for this reason. <coughs> someone who can see that there are millions of credulous people around will soon take advantage of the fact, will soon find a way to do so. So the struggle between people who think like me um, and our rivals, our enemies, is the struggle to raise the culture to the level where people are immune to appeals by, made by the cynical to the credulous. And I'll instance that further in replying to the rest of your question. Um, if you take the case of the communist revolution in Russia. Until 1917, uh, for centuries, the majority of impoverished, uh, enclaved Russians had been taught that their czar was not just an absolutist monarch, he certainly was that. He owned everything and everybody in the country, but that he was also the head of the Russian Orthodox Church and something a little more than human in his authority. If you were Joseph Stalin, inheriting a vast reservoir of credulity and backwardness like that. And having been trained as he was in a Russian Orthodox seminary, he could have been a great bishop if he concentrated a bit harder. Uh, you would be nuts not to exploit an opportunity of that kind. I mean, there, there you are. You have a ready-made, Christian-provided mob of people who, are pro who want to want a czar and want a god. Well, that's easily supplied. No country has ever fallen into despotism and misery because it followed the teachings of Spinoza and Thomas Jefferson and Albert Einstein. You see what I mean? 
I can go on about this if you want. I, well, perhaps if I might just follow up. But I think, up. I think, don't you think it's a fair answer to your question, as posed? Well, what, what and by the way, I find it interesting, because this comes up at every meeting I've ever had, and every argument, that's why there's a whole chapter in my book about it. The Christians are, are feeling a bit on the defensive now, and the religious in general, and they say, they keep bringing this up as if to say, okay, we're not that great, but at least we're not fascists and, and uh, Nazis. And kind of, well, I would want to say a bit more for myself than that, I've got to say. <laughs> And as a secularist, I don't have to make that dissociation. I don't have to. And I don't think that that's a fair characterization of the, the, the sentiment of my question, that, that uh, uh, if we, we could move to Jefferson for a moment, that the sort of spirit that, that uh, allowed American liberty to, to flourish in the founding was one in which uh, there was a recognition <coughs> that there was a place for God in public life. There was certainly a, a, a hatred of despotic uh, uh, a, a religious impulse, and, and Jefferson was the a marvelous crusader in that regard, but, but uh, there was also a recognition that there was a place for, for God in public life, just as Solzhenitsyn recognized that, I think. Oh, I didn't, well, your Solzhenitsyn point, I meant to say, Solzhenitsyn is borrowing there from Smerdyakov in the Brothers Karamazov, who says, without God, everything is possible. Smerdyakov is, of course, the moral idiot of the book, but his point is considered to be useful, and okay, if you can, you can be an atheist and say that means there's no law. You can be a nihilist and be an atheist, just as you can be a nihilist and be a Muslim or a Christian, or a sadist, or a casuist. There's no guarantee. But we think that morality is innate in human beings, and religion borrows it from us. And I think I could prove it uh, by reference to the Jewish and Christian testaments. Who here believes that until they got to the foot of Mount Sinai, the Jewish people thought that uh, murder, theft, and perjury were OK? But they, they got that far, that was amazed to be told, that's not cool anymore. <laughs> the answer is obvious. They couldn't have got that far. There couldn't have been a human society that thought otherwise. Voila. When the story is told of the man from Samaria, sometimes called the Good Samaritan, who we may or may not think of as an Orthodox Jew, we're not sure. The story is told of someone who goes out of his way to help a fellow creature in distress. Well, quite obviously, this person is not animated by the teachings of Jesus, or Jesus couldn't have known the story about him any more than he could have known the Golden Rule do not unto others what you would not wish to have done unto you, which comes from, well, the Analects of Confucius, at least as early as that, and also the teachings of Rabbi Hillel. In fact, you could say is innate, is a rule that you don't have to teach to children. But if you want someone to do something really nasty, you better get them to believe in supernatural authority. I return to my point. Things that no morally decent average person would consider doing can have a divine warrant. The gentleman uh, who asked, opened the bidding is a member of a church who call, which calls its, its head the prophet. That's what the Mormons call the head of their church. The prophet can tell you to do anything, and it doesn't matter whether it breaks the law or not. It's a commandment. You have to do it. That's why Governor Romney has to be asked whether he really is a member of this church or not. Yes, it is true. Yes, it is. <laughs> Well, just to uh, continue the point, Mao certainly did not come from a Christian nation, and he murdered many more people than Stalin did. But the, qu the point, what, what I would like to ask you is to uh, comment on what seems to me a contradiction. On the one hand, uh, what you say seems to me a very <coughs> nice sequel to Freud's The Future of an Illusion. Mm -hmm. um, but Freud went on to say that uh, human destructiveness was so strong that it could only be balanced not by reason, but by love. Now well, that's on the one hand, and the question is where that would come from. The second point is the, the contradiction. When you quote Jefferson, Spinoza, Einstein, you're talking about deists. You're talking about people who have a view of God which is not in any sense uh, anthropomorphic but it's still a sense of some kind of force that has a, that human beings need to connect to in order to fully develop their humanity. Yes. So I'd like you to comment on this contradiction. Uh, quickly on the Mao point, I could have added it to my Stalin one. I mean, Mao inherits a country full of stupefied peasants who believed for centuries that they lived in a middle kingdom that was di divinely ruled. So again, you have a pool of people who are very easily coerced, and uh, if you can't make use of that, you're, not, you're no good as a potential dictator. Why not dry up that pool a bit, uh, not have people ready to take things on faith and 
and fall to their knees and worship at any opportunity. On your second point, yes, I mentioned the future of an illusion a great deal because the connection between religion and wish thinking is so clear. Um, the moral superiority of atheism, I would say, as well as its intellectual superiority, is we, don't, we are not necessarily all that happy with our conclusion that, that this life is all there is and the annihilation follows it. It doesn't delight me to think this, though it probably delights my children because <laughs> um, parents have to make room. It would be obscene if one hung around, let alone if one proposed to hang around forever. Um, when you look at it like that, you can come reconcile to it quite easily. Uh, well, where does love come from? You're saying love comes from Mount Sinai, which m tells you to murder your fellow creatures and enslave them, and burn old ladies among them because they're witches? Where's the love in that? Where's the love in the preaching of hell by the Nazarene? Right? Where's the love saying, abandon your children? to come and follow me. Take no thought for the morrow, for clothing, for food. Just come and follow me. I'm the boss. Where's the love or morality in that? It only makes sense. Even C.S. Lewis is forced to concede it. It's the ravings of a madman, unless you believe the end of the world is coming real soon, and this person has some clue to it. Well, you might as well take the Kool-Aid right there. <laughs> this is not loving. However, I, I dare say that there are enough people in this room who will know from their own experience that love can be felt without any reference to these uh, invocations. Not just for... Oh, I'm rather touched to hear it. it. Makes me feel all moist and husky. Um, <laughs> and, and I might go a little further, than that, not just for another creature who might conceivably do you a sexual favour, but um, for your fellow mammals as well. Fragile, I admit, and inconsistent, but a lot better than being told you better be loving or we're going to torture you forever. <laughs> this, this is tripe. Sinister tripe. Oh, and the deism point. Well, of course, um, <clears throat> I actually don't think Spinoza was a deist. He was actually a pantheist. And what he said was, God is everything and everywhere. I don't mind people saying that. I don't mind people saying that at all. He didn't believe it gave you the right to tell anyone what to do. Jefferson was a very good paleontologist. Could have been a great one if he'd been born a few years later. He's still puzzling. Why are the seashells so high up on the mountains? 1819, he was still alive. The great day on which, it's February 1819, Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin are born, the two great emancipators. Darwin, much the greater one. Now there's no mystery. Before then, there was. Deism was the best that Jefferson, brilliant as he was, could possibly do. Now we don't need it. You can believe it if you like, but it's optional. Fine. Um, what does the, what does the um, Buddhist say to the hot dog vendor? Oh, you didn't? Make me one with everything. <laughs> as Jefferson said about religion in general, <laughs> as Jefferson said about religion in general, that neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Uh, oh my. Do you know what the hot dog vendor says in return? Not everyone knows part two. Well, the, he makes him one with everything and hands the Buddhist a slathered dog. The Buddhist hands over a $20 bill. It's all he's got under his saffron robes. Munches a bit, waits. He says, no, no money is forthcoming. And he says to the, finally to the vendor, where's my change? And the vendor says, change comes only from within. <laughs> You can, you can see it at DuPont Circle every day, people who want you to be spiritual. Well, I don't mind. I do not mind. Just leave me out of it. And babble all you like. It's fine by me. Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> but I insist, I insist. Don't try and teach this to my children. Don't try and put it in the schools. Don't get the president to talk piss on public occasions in this way. Uh, don't be praising people because they'll believe anything. Don't be telling me that jihadism is the expression of some suppressed grievance. Don't be telling me any of it. Don't tell me that God gave you the West Bank. None of this, because this is not a difference of opinion. This is a battle in which civilization is involved and in which they've had it all their own way for far too long. And people who care for civilization are going to have to fight and show that we, too, have unalterable convictions. We, too, have real principles that can't be changed. We won't call them faith or dogma, but don't mistake that for weakness. And yeah, you know what? On certain days, we too can be offended. I find that really offensive. <laughs> that you say to me that God is telling you to blow yourself up you know, in my city. No, no, it's offensive. It's worse than offensive. We're up with this, we will not put. Yeah. <laughs>
Can I ask a question over here? Sure. Thank Absolutely. You. Um, uh, you know, I think the, a lot of the laughter in the room betrays truly that th these questions are rightfully ones that hit us so deep in the heart that there's fear, they're, they're profound, and I, I think um, we all obviously come with presuppositions and views. One, one um, I would just say br briefly, I've struggled profoundly with belief questions and come to some convictions and come as a theist, monotheist. Um, and one of the things I'm curious about, one of the things I'm comfortable about is that as I've struggled more and more over time with these questions, there's a bit of trepidation that brings me here to um, face you, but as I've heard your arguments, and, and partly read your book quickly, I admit, but I want to ask a couple questions which aren't meant to be taken facetiously, but... Please, um, are, you don't need you to a, keep... You don't need you to keep, materialist? Sir, you don't need to keep clearing your throat like this. Don't sure. apologize. Get, get on with it, Rob. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. Um, I mean, many people thought the Earth was flat, and at vacuum, they were wrong, but... what? What I, what, I, what I do want to ask, one, is are, are you actually a materialist? Because you didn't qu kind of tell us what you were, and I should have read your book more carefully, but mm. is it... Is, as long we, as you... Sure, go ahead. Got a receipt for it, I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm a materialist, good, yeah. Okay, that's right. So... Believe me. So in this... It, good. And in, in, that, in that sense... <laughs> so, um, and in that sense, then, I'm just curious, do, do you feel when you express moral outrage or angst or frustration, and you might already know your answer to this, but I'm really genuinely just thinking about as you sort of, as people praise your writing and you kind of beautifully humble your head, um, what up? I mean, and now you want to say it's not quite beautiful. No, 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 no. Here, the question is, yes. is um, we, don't, we don't sort of see this behavior in in ant holes, and it is complicated, but how do you, do you feel that you're using borrowed capital a lot when you express outrage? Because salt and pepper in, in my, you know, in my medical lab don't fight each other. They don't, when I mix them, they don't get angry. If I reach my hand into someone's abdomen and rip out their liver, um, Good grief. Exactly. What are you talking exactly. about? Exactly. So, I, I hope the, the question, as much as I stuttered, is, is I'm ready to just hear what you thought. Yeah, no, look, uh, don't be, please don't be put off by my, my low humor or uh, attracting any laughter. I mean, you, you, you make a perfectly, to me, respectable point. I'd, there are some mysteries that I'm quite content not to know the answer to. For example, yes, of course I'm a materialist. I believe I'm made of atoms. Uh, the fact that there was no me um, 59 years ago doesn't terrify me at all. It was, as far as, it was a void where I might be, later was. There will later be similar void, slightly fatter. <laughs> um, <laughs> it has the same effect on me as it did on David Hume. Sure. Those are the breaks. That is, in fact, the situation. It's childish to pretend otherwise. No, uh, my friend Sam Harris, who, yeah. author of one of the better books of the that. Musketeer team, is in fact some kind of Buddhist. He does think, and he's a, he's a neuroscientist, he does think that there's, and we're having a great argument with him in, in pages of Free Inquiry, because we don't excommunicate each other in our sure, sure. <laughs> We asked him to sign up to say why he thinks there could be consciousness independent of the brain. It's a very interesting argument. I have no preconception about it. I have a strong feeling it's unlikely. Uh, whether it's true or not, that would remain uh, with me as a mystery, the following. Um, why do I care? <clears throat> why do I bother? Yeah. Why do I mind about Darfur? Why would I feel impelled, even if I found a wallet stuffed with money on the back seat of a cab and no one had noticed, to see if I can, what I can do about giving it back? Why have I got some wallets back that way myself? Yeah. I know it's a bit reductionist to say that without this capacity for solidarity, as I call it, empathy, um, the human species couldn't be having this discussion anyway. If, we, if this wasn't innate in us, we wouldn't be here. But to say, it, to say it's evolutionarily so select, positively selective still seems a little much like saying your love is a chemical reaction. So I go to poetry and to music when philosophy fails, um, knowing that that's about probably as far as I can go. Okay, that's but it, and it doesn't that's give me the right to tell anyone sure. else what to do. But in a way, you kind of are right there. Could I just say one more thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we should allow for the fact that he's 
probably in a minority as a believer, but can you make it crisp <laughs> this time? It's all good. It's all good. There, will, there, there will be. And thanks for Terse, your time. you know what I mean? It's all good. One, one, two little quick ones. One, it, 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 don't, don't, if what you believe isn't true... You see, they don't know when to stop, the faithful. <laughs> <laughs> they no. pretend to be modest, are they? No. <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm not modest. I know that about myself. So, so listen, here's the last You're question. Okay. I, I, as I spun up to the book, it said at the, just that you didn't really think there was evidence for J Jesus existing. And I, I wondered, are you, are you Kierkegaard? Are you playing with us? Or do you really believe that statement? There's no, no, this is a plain statement that anyone could make. Jesus of Nazareth is not a figure in history. Um, there is no firm evidence that he exists, existed. His, I have it in some detail in my book. None of his, uh, none of the apostles. We go through Bart Ehrman, so. Yes, there is Professor Ehrman's a very excellent book. But if if you didn't have Professor Ehrman's book and all you had was the four Gospels, uh, none of the four authors agree on any important fact about his life. They can't get the date right. They can't get the place of birth right. They clearly can't get the paternity right, um, <laughs> which I think is no small thing myself. <laughs> They can't know. It's all, it's, it's hopelessly discrepant. Uh, unfortunately, the Prophet Muhammad, you can say, is a figure in history, but that doesn't make it any more believable so that he really was dictated believe, uh, to by an archangel. You really do believe Jesus never existed? No, I say there's no reason to believe that he did. We're running, out, right. of We're running out of time. So I'm going to take two questions over there at uh, this mic, and then we got to uh, end it up. Hi, Mr. Hitchens. I'm Hello. a long-time admirer, and I like to read everything with your name after it. Go on. But I'm also... No, actually, hurry up. <laughs> right, how do you understand the millennia of testimony of answered prayer, of spiritual experiences beyond reason, of bad people becoming good through faith? What's the source for that? Do you believe there is a source in all things good? <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I, I believe people who tell me they've seen ghosts, for example and had visions of the Virgin Mary. I have no reason to doubt. I think they saw them, but they weren't there. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about those kind of um, experiences. You mean conversion experiences? People say, now I will finally... The President of the United States says, I will exchange uh, Jack Daniels for Methodism. <laughs> A trade I cannot imagine anyone making. <laughs> Because Jesus told me I should do it. Well, I think, I think that Laura Bush said, listen, and it's been said before in Texan society, it's Jack Daniels or me, asshole. <laughs> and if you do that again, I'll leave and I'll take the kids. You say, Jesus got me off the drink, fine. I said already, whatever floats the boat. Just leave me out of it. I don't want to hear this stuff, and it doesn't give you the right to tell me what to do. How many times must I say? How many times? Amen. How long, oh Lord, how long? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to what extent do you believe someone that is a sincere Marxist, which I understand you have been, or a sincere uh, 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 Darwinist, which you're professing as well, to be religious and have some kind of faith, uh, do you see Marx being influenced by his Jewish heritage and the, the family conversion to Christianity, trying to emulate the early church in Jerusalem as far as people giving up what they have voluntarily, but what is something he tried to force in Marxism. And in evolution, uh, Dar Darwin, Darwin's thinking, do you believe that uh, you descended from uh, a lower form like an ape? And do you believe that the, the links that are scientifically existing today prove evolution to your satisfaction? Uh, do you believe that uh, humans today, Caucasians, are a higher form than Negroes? Uh, that, uh, and Negroes are a, a, a higher you. form of the ape, which is actually what, similar to what the Mormon church seems to be believing. I hate to um, answer a question with a question. Are you not seeking the Republican nomination? <laughs> <laughs> because... If so, I saw that one of them. I saw one of them said that he wouldn't believe that he was descended from an ape, and I thought, that's what they think we think. It's amazing. They don't know as much as not to know. After all this time, when there was, when it was William Jennings Bryan versus Darrow and Mencken, it was an argument, you might say. It's not an argument now. Everybody knows. We think we have common ancestors with other primates, and as we did with the Cro-Magnons and the 
and the Neanderthals. And uh, we're quite lucky to be having this discussion mm -hmm. since 99.5 of all species ever existing <laughs> on the Earth have begun extinct. Some design, by the way. Um, so, Karl Marx, I can't, I can't call myself a socialist anymore. It fell away from me. I, I found I couldn't, I couldn't honestly say it any longer. But I have a very strong uh, affinity for Marx. Okay, I, our, our, last, our last question, I'm going to allow one more because it's oh, our first I was just getting my trousers off about Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, fine, question. you don't want to hear it anyway. <laughs> I'll wrap up with Marx. <coughs> okay. I am um, nice. absolutely terrified to speak. Terrified. But I know I the feeling. To. I can't stand it anymore. I am a very serious atheist, okay? I know so much about why I am an atheist. I could write a library if I like to write, which I don't. But I could, <laughs> because that's how serious it is to me, how much I... I'll tell you why. I used to be. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I don't have a question. I just have to stand up for the other side, for the atheist side. And I want to say something. It was the Mormon man who made me know I had to get up. He said something about uh, how can you know if you haven't had an experience of God. I used to be one of these very born-again types of Catholics. Not fundamentalists, but, you know, very... Oh, to me, Jesus was so real. I mean, I'd go shopping and talk to him, help me get a nice dress. I mean, it was very real to me. I had the, the right emotional makeup and imagination for it. Um, and I know what it's like. I mean, I went to Lourdes and Fatima. I used to go to Mass every day. I know what it's like to have what Protestants refer to as a personal relation, relationship with Jesus. I now know it was just an act of imagination. And I know what it's like, I know what it's like to have the positive side of religion, but I also know the dark side. It wasn't all nice and comforting. There was a lot of bad downside to it. I think we had to ask a question. No, I just wanted to Well no 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 Somebody this evening had to say a good word for atheism. I mean, really, I wanted to respond to the Lord man. That there and it had to be you. Here. Well. <laughs> Can't pick your friends. Well, I'm sure a lot of, I'm sure a lot of people here do know, do in fact know what you have been through. Um, was that is this goodbye or do I do the Karl Marx bit? They want it. Oh, well, it's in the book. Uh, I would say in the, in the list or history or anthology of uh, bogus quotations, uh, there's Dr. Johnson um, saying patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. You heard it when he was referring to the Patriot Party, not to patriotism. He was referring to John Wilkes. And as a Tory, he would never have said patriotism was scoundrelous. Uh, you get it all the time. I collect quotations that are dead wrong that everyone believes, but the, the most... Um, salient one in this case, I think, is the belief that Karl Marx referred to religion as the opium of the people, and it would serve as an ending just to show that I, I do not propose that everyone lives without <coughs> the numinous or the spiritual or the transcendent. Uh, what Marx said was, having announced that the, 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 the criticism of religion was the beginning of all criticism, because it was the beginning of philosophy, he said that religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, uh, the heart of the heartless world the spirit of a spiritless situation, uh, an opium for people. And he added that the demand to give up, its, the illusions in it was the demand to give up the condition that required illusions. And he ended rather beautifully by saying that criticism had plucked the flowers from the chain, not so that we should wear the chain without consolation, but so that we could break the chain and cull the living flower. And, well, I think it's well put. Thank you.